live from Beverly Hills, California, please welcome the president of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, Janet Yang. Good morning from Los Angeles, and for those who are watching around the world, good afternoon and good evening. Welcome to one of the most exciting days of the year. With our membership of nearly 11,000 film industry artists and leaders, our acclaimed film museum and collection, and our world-renowned awards, the Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts and Sciences, the home of global cinema. We recognize and celebrate all aspects of the film industry and the diverse, talented individuals who make movies. The Oscar nominees in almost every category were voted upon by peers in their branch. Actors vote for actors, film editors vote for film editors, costume designers for costume designers, and so on. Best Picture nominations, however, are determined by all Academy members. This year, we had incredible voter turnout with ballots cast from a record-breaking 93 countries. Today, we are thrilled to announce what our members feel are the best cinematic achievements of 2023. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our hosts. And one, and two, and uh, hello there all you fools who dream, and welcome to Spro and Lee Take on the Academy, the podcast for Academy Award do-overs. You got Lee here. And I'm Spro, and I'm tired. <laughs> Same. I am also tired. I couldn't complete the death march of all 53 or like 54 Oscar-nominated movies, and I probably shouldn't admit that at the beginning of the Oscar show for our Oscar-based podcast, but fuck it. I can't be the only one with a movie podcast that couldn't finish this race. But it makes me really kind of hate award season. I hate feeling obligated to do anything, but I hate feeling, really hate feeling obligated to watch everything that, that's up for anything. Every year I cram 40 movies into the span of like four to five weeks, which is my fault. I should be spreading them out a little bit better. But anyway, I get burnt out. And the worst of it is I end up with maybe two movies I'll carry around with me forever and the rest just sort of float through me. It's bonkers how many movies bound for Oscar gold are forgettable. But can we talk about what I hate now about the Oscars? What oh, the show I was, has I was just talking about what I hate. You mean you want to talk about what you hate? <laughs> Can we talk about me for a second? Yeah, let's talk about you. Well, really what the show Spro and Lee Take on the Academy has done to me, it's made me look harder at the thing that I love and it's almost like meeting your idol. <laughs> so okay. So like the top eight categories, we've talked about this before, but do you know how many movies are up for the awards in the top eight categories? And let me remind you, that's 45 nominations. That's no, but that's I'm gonna... seven, seven at five noms, and then one, the best picture, 10 noms. So 45 in all. Seven at five. Yeah, I'm checking your math. That, that Okay. Um, I bet it's going to be a really low number. It's so... sort of guessing by the way that you're <laughs> setting this all up. Yeah. 13. 13 wow. films. That's 10 of the Best Picture nominees, plus three more are up for the top 45 nominations. And what we're talking about, like the categories that we're talking about is Best Picture, Best Director, Best Actor, Best Supporting Actor, Best Actress, Best Supporting Actress, Best Adapted Screenplay, Best Original Screenplay. In those, there's only 13 films nominated. Wow. And then, fuck, if you throw in Best Editing, four, five more nominations, we're up to 50 nominations, it's the same 13 movies. Throw in costumes and production design. We're up to 60 nominations. You only add one more movie because of Napoleon. So 14 <laughs> movies are up for 60 nominations. So you're saying, you opened the show saying you couldn't watch 40 movies. And I'm going to argue, it looks like the Academy barely watched 20. <laughs> and I'm so sick of the lack of depth in my favorite award show. And it feels like it is just getting worse. So... Research, 321 films were eligible for Academy Awards this year, with 265 eligible for Best Picture. And I think what we're saying is 56 films didn't meet the criteria that you will introduce later. But you're telling me, <laughs> you're telling me, you're telling me 300 
of these films held no artistic merit in any of the categories. You're telling me we suck so much in making films that only 14 had great enough directing, great enough acting, great enough writing, and overall greatness that they received, I don't know, like any of the 80% of the nominations. This should bother the artists that make up the Academy voters the most. I don't know what greatness you've done in your life to get to where you are, where you're an Academy of Voter, but you are not exemplifying your greatness with these unoriginal, uninspired nominations. The most prestigious award show output is some basic bitch shit. The equivalent of the high school that nominates the QB class president. The Academy neither surprised nor educated me this year. What could we possibly say to make the Academy better? Like, do better. The obvious answer is that you start fucking with the campaign process, try to make it a little bit more equitable for the lower budget independent films. Uh, But I think it has to come from the Academy and it needs to start with the shortlists. The shortlists are decided just like the Oscars by members of the Academy. So just in the same case as actors vote for actors, directors vote for directors, and so on, the shortlists are being culled by people in the business, which sounds great on paper, but I think most of them are just kind of letting themselves be quickly swayed and just carried away by the wind of the Oppenheimers and and the maestros and the whatever else. And it's just lazy. They don't work four jobs like you do. (laughs) The problem that also frustrates me is the Academy Awards are last. They are last in the awards season. So really, they could copy the paper and the homework of everybody, every, like, the DGAs. Well, they, they do. The, they kind of do. A little bit, but not, like, the Independent Spirit Awards had, like, four to five movies in the Academy Awards. This year. Like, the Zone of Interest, sure. The Little Splash in the Ponds. Watch those movies. Like, I think my problem is you can inject the Academy with whatever you want to try and make it more palatable for the general audience, to try and get more viewers into the show. But if those people do not watch movies, your nomination process is going to continue to suck. I cheered the fact back in the day that actors nominated actors and writers nominated writers. But then I started thinking about it and saying, well, they're going to nominate their friends. Actors are going to nominate the directors they want to work with. What we've always said, I guess, I'm coming to the realization now that it's Hollywood patting itself on the back. And this isn't the most prestigious award show anymore. This is the biggest reach around. So that's my frustrations, I think, with the we're going to get into the nominations this episode. But I am really coming to the table disappointed. I feel you. I I love that you brought it up, and I think, um, you know, maybe we start sounding like a broken record eventually, but somebody's got to say it. Let's talk predictions for the 2024 movie season. I know, I forgot to do these in the last yeah. episode, and oh, I really? like I didn't go over, like, Fucking all good. the political stuff, because one, I turn off the politics, so, so much happier. You tried to talk to politics the other day, and I was like, mm, nope, sorry, no, I know. I tried off. to talk, I tried to talk entertainment, because that's what The Daily Show is, it's entertainment. It's, is it's it? Sti- it's sti- sure, it's prop comedy. He uses the news as, as comedy. I can't believe you wouldn't make an exception. No for, way, man. For Jon Stewart's return to The Daily Show, but whatever. My only question, the only thing I'm really curious about is, why is he back? He had like a show going on like his own little podcast and everything which i liked his parts of it i didn't like the people that he brought on i think the show's kind of been in decline and turmoil for a little while how long ago did trevor noah leave like within the last like six months 12 months it doesn't matter i think he felt maybe he could do some good in a pretty pivotal year and that's not to say for either one of the two political parties because he takes no prisoners but we're we're talking tv this talk about your fucking predictions jesus all right sorry well i mean he was a movie star because he was in the faculty and big daddy and half baked i love all those movies All right, so we didn't make it necessarily clear in the last episode, but when I predicted in 2022 that the box office of 2023 was going to exceed $9 billion, I was wrong. The COVID year of 2020 was the ass kicker at $2.1 million. 2021, we doubled that to 4.4. 2022 was 7.3. So I thought $9 billion was a safe bet as everybody got more comfortable to go out to the theaters. But we only did $8.9 billion last year. So I was close, but I would not have won any money 
money on that prediction. My prediction for this year is we don't even beat $8.9 billion in 2024. 2025 will do better than both 2023 and 2024, but I think this is another year where it's no 2009 to 2019 decade when the domestic box office was making 10 figures. Um, prediction number two, I'm not going to follow the election, but I predict somebody steals it, quote unquote, steals it. Whether it's the Republicans in Russia or the Democrats in ballot stuffing, a third of America is going to be pissed because the election was fraudulent somehow, some way. Number three. One major streaming service is either bought out or folds. Move through your predictions. I want to talk about <laughs> Number Oscars. four. I don't care about this one, but I like stirring the pot. And every time I bring up Taylor Swift, it feels like everybody just gets very nervous. And so I'm going to predict that Travis Kelsey and Taylor Swift are not together by the time we do this Oscar pre-show 2025. Are those long odds? Well, I feel like all Taylor Swift, Travis Kelsey fans are like, this is our fairy tale romance. And I, to me, it feels Bachelor. Because everybody goes on The Bachelor and falls in love because their first date is a fucking helicopter ride through a canyon with a dozen roses like falling in everybody's laps. Like, it's hard not to fall in love under those circumstances. It's hard not to fall in love when one of them has the biggest tour of, like, the century and the other one wins the fucking Super Bowl. Like, Mm. the stars are aligned. What happens in May... (laughs) When they're both like back to whatever grind of a work day that they have. When the fairy dust is off, nobody flies. You know what I'm saying? You know, you preface this with, I don't care about this one. (laughs) Kind of feels like you've given this quite a bit of thought. Move it on. All my assistants are Swifties. All right. Number five. Gladiator 2 is going to bomb. Maybe not financially, but barely makes a dent. And then, this is kind of number six. Ridley Scott's going to talk about retirement. Martin Scorsese is going to talk about retirement. Quentin Tarantino talks about retirement. It seems 2025 is the end of the road for some of these old guys. Martin Scorsese says he's close to the end, but he hasn't said he's done. I think he's about there. Really? I think he's got that, that, I think he's got a documentary project in the works. Then he was going to be like, I got one more in me. I feel like Ridley Scott's going to be, I have one more in me. Martin Scorsese has one more. And then Quentin Tarantino has already said it. I think Ridley Scott's going to keel over, uh, you know. In Video Village, I don't. Uh, well, he's never, whether he retires or God retires him, we God's won't. gonna re- yeah, God's gonna retire him. He's not gonna stop making movies as long All as right. people will give him money. Uh, okay. And then lucky number seven prediction: at least five of the top ten box office movies next year are owned by Disney or one of its subsidiaries. Isn't that? Isn't it at least five from twenty twenty three? I don't know. Is it? I don't know. Is it? <laughs> I asked you. <laughs> what were the top five of twenty twenty three? At least, no, you said at least five of the top ten, and I'm saying I think close to five, if not five, from the top ten of 2023 were owned by Disney or its subsidiaries. You had Guardians, Ant-Man. Nope. No Ant-Man. Oh. Yeah. Where yeah. Quantum Mania was number ten. Hold on. Hold on. This is worldwide. I'm in worldwide. You had, oh, top ten worldwide is what I'm talking. You're talking domestic? Yes. I don't care about world. So you go worldwide, then it's like, oh my gosh, everybody loves Fast 11. No, Domestic, Guardians, mm-hmm. Little Mermaid, mm-hmm. Ant-Man. Mm-hmm. So three. Were the Elemental top wasn't on the top 10? Uh, no, Elemental was 17. Okay. Um, so I always go worldwide. So you got to, if you're going to talk top 10 box office, you got to, we both need to start qualifying. Worldwide versus domestic, because I always think in terms of worldwide. All right, enough of this bullshit. Let's get into the 96th Academy Awards ceremony. The show begins at 7 p.m. Sunday, March 10th, 2024. Jimmy Kimmel returns as host for the fourth time. And while I don't have anything against him, I I really think they can do better. Do you want to nominate somebody? Somebody that you'd like to see host? Somebody maybe who's never done it before? I feel like I always say just like, let's just slate Tom Hanks in. Like, retire him. No more movies, Tom Hanks. And then the only time we see Tom Hanks is hosting the Academy Awards. He just like walks out and we go, oh, it's time for the show to start because lovable Cleveland-owned Tom Hanks is up there. Seems like sort of an ignominious end for such an illustrious career. It's like watching a, a comic that used to sell out arenas go to a cruise ship. But Maybe. it's like, it's where Bob Hope was. It's kind of like Ryan Seacrest taking over I, for Dick Clark. Like, man, I don't want to see. It's a changing of the guards, I think. I don't want to see puffy face Tom Hanks host. I, I stand by somebody young and vibrant like Aquafina. I think she would be funny. <laughs> or somebody with an Aquafina vibe. You really like Aquafina. I do. I enjoy her. All right. The Governor's Awards which were held on the 9th of January, uh, were hosted by comedian John Mulaney, speaking of new blood. 
Uh, at those awards, Angela Bassett, Mel Brooks, and editor Carol Littleton all received honorary Oscars, and executive Michelle Satter received the Gene Herschel Humanitarian Award. Obviously, these awards aren't given out on the big night due to time constraints, but I gotta say, and no disrespect to the three female recipients, Mel Brooks' award should have been moved to March 10th. It just should have. The producers, Young Frankenstein, Blazing Saddles, Spaceballs, his name is forever cemented in American film. He sprinted so the Zucker brothers and the Wayans brothers could skip and jump. Do you have a favorite Mel Brooks movie? Spaceballs. I'll throw Spaceballs with like a Blazing Saddles like high on its heels. But yes, I agree that he should be moved to March 10th if he still resembles himself because I do not like it when the Academy Award wheels out somebody that's Uh, just Liza Minnelli (laughs) Liza Minnelli or Kirk Uh, Douglas you know somebody that they just all go like (laughs) you like I can't even there's not another thing that we do I think as a society like wheeling out somebody in front of a crowd like that for applause and then everybody with their glass smiles who is it's Shane Gillis I think has like the the line of like it's like going to your friend's house and the 16 year old dog walks out and you're like there he is (laughs) he's looking great that's comparable that's comparable (laughs) all right So, Spro, you watched the actual nomination announcements, which I don't ever do. Um, Why? This should be a much bigger moment, I think, of Academy Award production than it is. Nobody watches them. Nobody really cares about them. They're pretty much streamed on YouTube. And so the only reason why I was able to watch them this year is because we had an ice day and I didn't have to go to work. So I was like, oh my gosh, this is serendipity. I'm going to sit down and I'm going to watch the Oscar nominations. And when I did, I went, "Um, "Who? I don't even barely care about this right now. In the past couple of years, I found ways to watch them, whether I stay at work and just stream them from the computer or like this year, doing it from my couch. And this year was Zazie Beats and Jack Quinn. Wade announcing the nominations to a live studio audience. The nominations were like 10 minutes, so I wonder exactly how much entertainment that audience got for however long they stood outside. I mean, it was 8.30 in the morning, New York time. So it's 5.30 in the morning, LA time. Um, It was also noticeable that Zazie Beat's dress broke, so they took a break. And I was like, oh, they're commercials during this whole thing? But it was the only break in the entire show. So it was obviously just to fix her dress. But there was suddenly a live feed that was broken during the best editing nominations. So I had to pause it, go back to see who was nominated for best editing. And I just, I think about the people that are sitting by their TVs, just waiting to hear their name. So fuck ups during this whole process. Just, I was like, oh man, that sucks to be those people. Even if it is Bradley Cooper. But then the second thing that was weird to me, that live audience was weird. And it's also weird considering the fact that they reacted differently to their favorite nominations. So, like, they would all go apeshit when Barbie's name was, which then is very sad because when somebody else's name, (laughs) you know, like Ryan Gosling, everybody's applauding. So then, like, Sterling K. Brown's name comes up for American Fiction, which probably half the audience that waited outside at 530 in the morning, they're like... Uh, and I was like, God, that sounds fucking horrible when only that's one of these people are waves. Gonna... <laughs> Which, uh, that's why I was like, well, I'm good with that. Except then I watched American Fiction and was like, no, I have no, we'll get to it. And then they don't, they also don't announce the names with some of the awards, uh, like the filmmakers behind documentaries or even the editors. They didn't get named, just their films that they edited. It felt like they had better things to do at the time and yet they're announcing their nominations. So I was like, what do you have against editing that you're not going to name the editors? They don't have anything against editing. They're just thinking about ratings and, and naming nominated editors isn't exciting to most people. But why do it for the audience? Do it for the artists that you want to honor. Yeah, that's a fair argument. But again, they want eyeballs and ears and ratings. <sighs> It's so fucking sad. Anyway, Oppenheimer received the most nominations with 13. Poor Things and Killers of the Flower Moon came in second and third with 11 and 10 nominations, respectively. And if you look across the top eight categories, like I said earlier, from the two writing categories on up to Best Picture, only 14 movies in total were included. Yeah, it's typical. They do not spread the wealth 
but that's the Academy Awards that we gave so much of a shit about. We decided to start a podcast about them. On a related, unrelated note, 2024 marks the first official implementation of the Academy's new diversity rules. Now, I have painstakingly copied these from the website into our little document here. I don't want to read them. I don't want to bore anyone. Can you read them without boring them? I will do a little bit of an overview so that people get an idea. So there are several standards. Uh, For example, standard A is called on-screen representation, comma, themes, uh, and narratives. You have to meet at least one of the following criteria, and it deals with lead actors or significant supporting actors being from underrepresented racial or ethnic groups, uh, 30% of all actors being from some underrepresented, at least two underrepresented groups, and then the main storyline theme or narrative is centered on an underrepresented group. Standard B deals with creative leadership and project team. So this is like casting directors, cinematographers, composers, costume designers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, all the kind of behind the scenes sort of positions on a film. Again, they need to have a certain percentage of underrepresented groups. And it goes on and on. Standard C is industry access and opportunities. This is the one that I had to read the closest. Um, The film distribution or financing company has paid apprenticeships or internships that are from the following underrepresented groups and satisfy the criteria below. And then standard D, audience development. And in standard D, a film must meet all the criteria listed here in standard D. And when when I'm saying it must meet one or all of these criteria, that's to be considered for best picture. And standard D is, it's just more of the same. And I read over all of this and the biggest takeaways that I had were, except for where otherwise stated, specifically in standard D bullet two, All of this applies only to the Best Picture category. Now, I presume they believed by applying these standards to Best Picture that they would diffuse downward into other categories. Do you think that's true? I think their hearts are in the best spot. And I do want to point out before moving on, 265 movies were eligible for Best Picture. 265. So when we're talking about how the Oscars only did their homework on 14, it has nothing to do with these diversity things. They were just they were just being lazy before some racists were like but that, but that. That's why there's no... Like, no. It has nothing to... There was 265 diverse films that they could have chosen from, and they decided to go with Bradley Cooper's Maestro. <laughs> what, did you think they were going to trickle down? Yeah. I, I presume they believed by applying these standards to Best Picture that it would just naturally diffuse downward into other categories, which, as we've pointed out, kind of happened. I mean, all those other categories... What was it? The 10 Best Pictures nominees plus four? Yeah. But is that a result of, of this? Who knows? I think it's it's difficult. Obviously, you know, we're, we're not trying to be obstinate here. We, we champion diversity. We, we would love to see new voices. We would love to see different colors other than white and hear the stories of, and narratives from different cultures. I also don't know if this is the best way to do it. Well, I don't know. I guess what I don't know is they're telling us what they're doing, but they're not necessarily telling us how they're doing it. And so it's like, how how are you selecting these people? Regardless if this is hashtag Oscar so white or the new diverse infused Oscars, we're getting the same shit nominations. <laughs> so uh, what can we find people that watch movies that watch at least like one movie a day that will really put in the homework and take their job as a member of the Academy Awards seriously to give us a wealth because the Academy Awards at the end of the day, yes, it's Hollywood slapping itself on the back, but at the end of the day, it gives attention to some of the movies that nobody has ever heard before. A lot of the times when the Academy announces its nominations, those movies go back into theaters or are introduced to a wide range of theaters where before they were only in Los Angeles based theaters for a week. So if we're going to say, and I truly believe this, I went to the the Margaret Herrick Library. I know that the Academy's whole purpose in life is to champion movies. The problem is they're not championing enough of them and what they are championing were campaigned for, were bought for to be champions. So it's like, are we really celebrating artistic merit? So do you think this is just optics? Yeah, I think they're trying to shout down the people that were like, Oscar's so white. 
it's great that they're trying to do better, but you also can't just inject diversity and be better. Like you still have to, you still have to put in the work. It's one of my favorite quotes. I think it's James Richardson is all work is the avoidance of harder work. And so they're doing this, but they're not really doing everything they can to fix the problem. They're putting a filling in a tooth that needs a root canal. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right, let's move on. Uh, one last thing before I we said, do. let's move on. No, 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 because they also don't want to be mean. So probably what they should have done is inject diversity at the t- same time, scraping the tartar of the old guard out. I guess you're like tenured when you become an Academy member, unless you slap somebody on stage and get suspended for 10 years. But like... They should have looked at their the cesspool that became hashtag Oscar so white and taken some of those old white men out, then injected the diversity. And Spro and Lee are the hard plastic little film x-ray things that they put in your mouth and they're like, bite down. And you're like, it's digging into the roof of the bite. You got to bite down. I like to picture myself as the rubber bands and the braces. Like, get your jaw back here. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever have braces? Never. No braces, no dental surgery, no cavities. Look at you. I brush once a day. I would change that, but I've had really good luck just brushing once a day. I still have my wisdom teeth. Oh, wow. No dental surgery here. Lucky you. So you're trying to compromise here today because I don't like to talk about the little categories and I don't think anybody likes to listen. Um, So let's talk about the big daddies first. Yes. And then if the audience wants to skip the rest of the episode, they can't. Can can I skip the rest of the episode? (laughs) Yeah, I'm like, I listen to, I like, I listen to podcasts, but I definitely skip around. When the crime is solved and the true crime stuff, I'm usually done with those episodes. I get it. So we'll talk about like the big six, the big eight first, and then the mid four, and then the rest. And I think the rest of the episode will be informational and people can be like, all right, I'll see you guys March 10th. <laughs> Best picture. <laughs> Your nominees are American Fiction, Anatomy of a Fall, Barbie, The Holdovers, Killers of the Flower Moon, Maestro, Oppenheimer, Past Lives, Poor Things, and The Zone of Interest. Any possible snubs you want to discuss for this category? I mean, May, December deserve to be nominated for Best Picture. Over Barbie, over Maestro, over the holdovers. I haven't done the math, but was it omitted because it didn't meet the new diversity requirements? And I don't want to think about that. I did read an article that said people were unhappy with May, December because they felt like it was making fun of Hollywood. And as we know, Hollywood loves itself, right? So like, It does. <laughs> but in the same instance, I'm surprised that you would say that it probably should have been nominated over Barbie because... Why are you surprised? Have you read ahead? Well, I don't want to spoiler alert, but this whole fucking episode is going to be Lee just rubbing his nipples over how much he liked Barbie. <laughs> Well, May, December is a better movie than Barbie. The fact is, though, that Barbie is what I was given. So, you know, I buried the lead and you dug it up. So let's talk about it. I think the only movies with any real chance of winning this Best Picture Oscar are obviously Oppenheimer. And I also think Barbie. I think Killers of the Flower Moon is a better made film than Barbie. But I don't think it has a chance in hell of winning. I don't think Barbie has a chance at all. You don't see the female constituents of the Academy maybe lining up to vote this one to the pillars? No. <laughs> no, I like I think you think Barbie has a chance, like the people who thought Top Gun Maverick had a chance last year. I get that you and a lot of people liked Barbie, but there's no way, despite my hatred for the Academy's shallowness, they're shallow in that way with their noses still in the air. So I think Oppenheimer, Holdovers, Past Lives, Zone of Interest, and Killers are all the top five. But truly, this is Oppenheimer's year. You would be taking the long odds if you voted against, if you bet against Oppenheimer. Oh, yeah. I'll jump into Lake Erie March 11th, regardless of the temperature outside, if it doesn't win. Oh, boy. I'll put that down right now. Yeah. You're probably right, but I'm going to be a fool who dares to dream 
And I'm kind of hoping that the best picture category provides the big upset for 2024. And I think Barbie is the only movie that could possibly do it. I don't like the comparison you made to Top Gun Maverick because I think Top Gun Maverick is <sighs> banal masculinity. It was a movie made for men. Barbie was a movie made for women. Mixed together with Gen X and millennial nostalgia. It makes no point at all. And I think Barbie does. I think Barbie's got a lot to say. I don't think Top Gun had anything to say. What did Barbie have to... Barbie was... you, Ladies, you can do it? I think it's about self-realization. Not just for women, but Ken, for, for men as well. It's very much about individuality and identity. And I think it is clever. And there's nothing clever about Top Gun Maverick. It's a visual feast, not clever. And for the record, I'm fine if Oppenheimer wins. But I, I'd rather see Barbie win. And I'll go a step further and I say I think it should win. <sighs> Gross. <laughs> <laughs> Oppenheimer's boring. Well, I'm not gonna boring. I'm, I'm not gonna disagree. It was it was too long. I don't want to harp too much on Barbie today because I don't have all my thoughts together. But I sat in that theater and my girlfriend at the time looked over and she was like, "You hate this, don't you?" And I was like, "I'm gonna get through it. <laughs> I'm gonna get through this." That movie definitely wasn't for me. I didn't get anything about it. A lot of the times there was long monologues about, oh, like, poor me and poor us and poor this. And like, in my head, I was just saying same shit, different day of since the beginning of and time, really. We're all just trying to figure it the fuck out, but work together and do so. But I guess it's a good time now to say if you tune into next season, we're going to deep dive the quote-unquote snubs of Greta Gerwig and Margot Robbie this year. Spro has concocted an episode that I still don't really truly understand. Well, we're really going to see if there's something to what the masses are saying, or if they're even more wrong than anyone in the media will tell them. After all, the media can't really say the masses are wrong because they want the masses' money. Where here, we'd like reviews, but we're not banking on them. And so, as our longtime listeners know, Lee himself has called the masses dum dumps a couple of times. I'm just surprised he became one when it came to Barbie. <laughs> oh, low blow. <laughs> I wouldn't put Barbie in my top 100 favorite films of all time, but for all of the reasons that Oppenheimer deserves Best Picture... There are symmetrical reasons that Barbie does too. See, and I would say Barbie deserves the popcorn of the MTV Movie Awards. Absolutely. Why? Because it's pink and bright and positive? Because it's entertainment and it entertained a bunch and it made a bunch of money for... You don't think in 20 years there's going to be girls who were 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 and saw that movie and felt invigorated by it? Maybe. The same way that 20 years later, I still think the original Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles makes me want to pretend like I'm swinging a bow around the backyard. 20 years later? <laughs> 40. What year do you think it is? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I'm sad that the Barbie movie had to tell you that you could make it. But let me tell you something, dear listener. You can do it. You don't need the people that gave countless women eating disorders to tell you that you could actually be a good person nowadays. So your beef lies with the Mattel Corporation, is what you're saying. The evilest of evil empires. <laughs> well, it is just kind of weird how we gave, have given them a pass. We're like, that was a really good movie. We're going to forget everything we hated about Barbie until this point. Because Margot Robbie made us laugh, and it was well-casted. Well-casted. Speaking of which, we don't even have it in our notes to talk about. There's going to be a best casting category for the next Oscars. Barbie, hands down, should win that. This movie would fucking suck if it had anybody else other than Margot Robbie and Ryan Gosling and Michael Sarah and everybody making an appearance. If it was Amy Schumer and that one dude from Pitch Perfect, I don't know. That movie would have been a streaming service thing. The casting of Barbie, to me, was the best part. It was what made that movie a billion dollars. Well, I think it was the partnership that Gerwig formed with Margot Robbie, who in turn produced the film. And then I also think it, it had a lot to do with Gerwig's vision on how to make the movie 
not be a joke. I mean, one of the best things that she said in all of her junkets, all of her press junkets, was... I'm paraphrasing. She didn't say it like this, but, you know, everybody's going to expect this movie to be a complete piece of shit. She basically told the studio, like, I got a way that we can make it sort of lean into that. And I guess Mattel or the producers, other producers, the studio were hesitant. And she just insisted. She's like, we got to lean into it. Not only do I think she, she does that really well, but she also, she takes that plastic femininity of the Barbie doll and reminds women that it's important to, among other things, feel confident in one's physical appearance. Yes, Barbie changed everything. Then she changed it all again. All of these women are Barbie, and Barbie is all of these women. She might have started out as just a lady in a bathing suit, but she became so much more. She has her own money, her own house, her own car, her own career. Because Barbie can be anything, women can be anything. And this has been reflected back onto the little girls of today in the real world. Girls can grow into women who can achieve everything and anything they set their mind to. Thanks to Barbie, all problems of feminism and equal rights have been solved. Um, American fiction, I'm, I'm not interested in talking about. Anatomy of, of a Fall was good. The Holdovers, we can talk, we can save that for the, the screenplay discussion. Killers of the Flower Moon, uh, you're kind of on record saying that you weren't the, the biggest fan. You thought it was overlong. I'm excited to watch it again. You won't ever watch that one again, will you? It's Oppenheimer to me. You know, like it was a good one watch. I think it's, be- it's definitely better than Oppenheimer. I would disagree with you there. But in the same instance, I fell asleep in both, you know? (laughs) Maestro, I don't understand why it's up there. I thought it was... I mean, I I don't even have the word to describe what it was. Boring is too kind for what it was. It was a complete misfire. It's got like, it's, I think, mid-70s on Metacritic. Like, this was campaigned in. The problem is, it wasn't just campaigned in. It's up for a lot of awards. We could do a whole episode just removing every single nomination that Maestro has received, because I guarantee you it did not deserve 90% of them. Past Lives, I'm with you. I, I, I would put that in my top three of these Best Picture contenders. Poor Things, not interested in talking about. And Zone of Interest was experimental and interesting and boring. Yes. I'm surprised you don't want to talk about poor things, though. Why are you surprised? I thought that was a good movie. I like the writing. I like how it was like a Frankenstein-ish story. I definitely like the acting. That kept me engaged. I like the pace of it. I like the fact that it was under two hours, that they made like a competently paced film. Was it perfect? No. I By the end, I was like, shave 10 minutes off this so I can get out of this theater. As far as what we're talking about, that's top five, easily. But maybe Past Lives is the only one I watch again out of any of these 10. Really? I'll definitely watch Barbie again. Fuck. <laughs> so I can feel better about myself. <laughs> I cried. I laughed. I enjoyed myself. And maybe it was because I saw it, I think, a week after the absolute limp dick dial of destiny. <laughs> but it lifted me up. I could see myself rewatching Holdovers. Not because I think it's a great movie, but because I think Paul Giamatti is great. Which is a nice segue to talk about Best Actor. Nominees for Best Actor in a Leading Role are Bradley Cooper for Maestro, Coleman Domingo for Rustin, Paul Giamatti for The Holdovers, Killian Murphy for Oppenheimer, and Jeffrey Wright for American Fiction. Got any snubs you want to discuss? Obviously, there was dirt kicked up over Leo not being included, but I think we're both okay with that. Look, I think this category is the biggest mess. Most actors here are doing what they always do. And if we had a term for streepy noms, this is the streepiest. 
we do have a term. You coined it. You coined it the Streep effect. When names when names get nominated instead of performances. That said, though, it's nice to see Coleman Domingo on here, mm-hmm. who A, wasn't on my radar previously. Was he on yours? Doubt it. No. And B, was the best thing about Rustin. Agreed. And really, I wasn't hyped on the nomination until I saw Domingo giving an actor's roundtable interview. And I was like, oh, this dude is not like that dude at all. So that one was probably the biggest surprise and the one that I like the most, but man, we definitely went streeping on the best male category with Jeffrey Wright being Jeffrey Wright, Paul Giamatti doing Paul Giamatti things, Killian Murphy being Killian Murphy, you know, like if you're going to look at this list and be like, they were transformational. Well, Giamatti's never been nominated for Best Actor. Killian Murphy's never been nominated for Best Actor. Jeffrey Wright's never been nominated for Best Actor. So let's just nominate them this year because why the fuck not? <laughs> like, Because we're not going to watch any other movies. None of the other 265. Well, Denzel only had, you know, the Equalizer 3 or 4 or whatever <laughs> it was. So they can't nominate. I mean, they could have, but it would have been weird. Just like Bradley Cooper and Maestro. Yeah. He made me believe in that nose. (laughs) (laughs) So, speaking of Coleman Domingo, does anyone not have a chance? Coleman Domingo is probably the darkest of dark horses. I mean, I think this is Killian Murphy all the way. Like, I I would be surprised if it's anybody else. It's been his, well, it's been his award to lose all year, but I think Giamatti's nipping at his heels a little bit. Who do you want to win? Bradley Cooper, just so I can hate them. No, you don't. <laughs> Who do I want? I want I, Killian Murphy. It's fine. Like, I, as, as an actor goes, I love him. I did not like the holdovers as much as everybody else. So if we're going to nominate or if we're going to award Paul Giamatti for anything, I don't want it to be for this movie. But I think I enjoyed most of his other movies more than I enjoyed the holdovers. Even Win Win, which we watched last season, I enjoyed more than the holdovers. Yeah, I I would love to see Killian Murphy accept. I would also love to see Giamatti accept. Giamatti's got my heart. Sideways is a top 50 for me, probably. Ooh, you just narrowed your eyes at that. Not a fan, huh? No. All right. Fair enough. It's certainly no Top Gun Maverick, <laughs> but it's definitely a movie made for men. Fine. But it's not about heroes, that's for sure. No. Not about plane flying, cape wearing, sunglasses. Does it tell you how you should believe in yourself? Um. From the makers of eating disorders? <laughs> all right. Let's talk best actress. Your nominees for best actress in a leading role are Annette Benning. God damn. <laughs> question mark. For Nyad. Lily Gladstone, Killers of the Flower Moon. Sandra Huller. For Anatomy of a Fall, Carrie Mulligan for Maestro, and Emma Stone for Poor Things. That's right. Little Emma Stone, girl who got head-butted by Jonah Hill in Superbad and went, (laughs) Fuck! Is now possibly going to win her second Oscar. That's right. (laughs) Any snubs for this category? We already discussed our surprise and dismay that both Portman and Moore weren't nominated here or in supporting. Yes, and we probably should discuss Benning's nomination and Lily Gladstone's barn burning of Super Bowl mascots, which is not going to do her any favors. I don't think Benning should be nominated. I do think she did a very nice job. I I mean, it's six or one half dozen the other. If you don't think Paul Giamatti should have been nominated, this is basically the same thing. Except Benning's probably like 10, 15 years older than he is, right? Is that about right? I don't know. Something like that. It's the same thing. It's a, I mean, I think Benning's role was probably harder. Has she, she was nominated for her Academy Awards. Has she never won? Annette Benning's never won an Oscar now. Mm. I like Nyad. I cried during Nyad. Jesus Christ, what's wrong with you? I'm emotional, man. <laughs> Nyad was literally like, gonna swim, obstacle, gonna swim again obstacle. I think it got better as it went along. I thought the first hour I was like, god damn that I have this podcast that I have to watch movies like this. <laughs> but I thought it got better. It got much better. I thought the performances amped up. I thought everything amped up as it went on. So Much how I felt like with Barbie, where it's like if the casting wasn't there, I'd have very little interest in finishing this movie. That's how Nyad was for me. Like, I was finishing it because of Annette Benning. I was finishing it because of Jodie Foster. I was finishing it because of the ship's captain from... Reese Ifan. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say Notting Hill. It's fucking great. <laughs> His American accent leaves something to be desired, but he was also very good. <laughs> yeah. But the script of Nyad was... That was tough. Yeah. 
Well, it's fucking, it's Rudy, it's Hoosiers, it's Moneyball. It's not as good as Moneyball, but it's that same kind of like, come on, man, let's fucking do it, man. I think Gladstone, um, you mentioned that she's been barn burning Super Bowl mascots. Um, Which the Chiefs, I get it. And then she was like, and then she went after the 49ers and I was like, well, now we're stretching. (laughs) Yeah. Hey, wait a minute. How do you know that? You're not supposed to be reading media. Because they were talking about during the Super Bowl. I watched the Super Bowl. Oh, isn't that media? It's sports. Or is that entertainment? It's sports. That's the third category. (laughs) Oh, okay. All right. Anyway, I think Gladstone probably read the writing on the wall vis-a-vis Emma Stone. So she self-destructed her own campaign before she could just lose it. Looks like she's going to lose it. Looks like Emma Stone's going to take it. But nothing's a done deal. Right. And I also want to shout out Carrie Mulligan from Maestro. Wasn't as wild as you, but she is consistently good. Above average. I would say she's above average, but she I don't think consistently good. It's kind of like I, the performance that she turned in for Maestro. I was watching Maestro and I was like, the only thing I like about this goddamn movie is Carrie Mulligan. And I've shat on her on the podcast in the past. So then I had to make a marginal note of, hey, Spro, credit where credit is due. I feel like you, you're talking about Promising Young Woman. I felt like you shat on that oh, that fuck. movie more than you than you gave her a hard time. You've been positive. Well, nothing was good about that movie. <laughs> You've been positive about Carrie Mulligan. Yeah, in education, she's great. The Great Gatsby with Leo, she's great. But this movie, completely fine. I would be completely fine with her winning it over Emma Stone. But if Emma Stone wins, it's the most prestigious set of Mardi Gras beads I've ever seen. It's a savage take. And you really think that it'll be because she showed her boobies. Oh, yeah. It's so daring. (laughs) Otherwise, it's the I Am Sam Award, and nobody wants to have that conversation. I think that puts her in a long list of women who have shown their bodies in film and never won anything for it. Or the ones that did. I thought we were past this phase in society where nudity was so shocking and daring that we would award things for it. Do you think her performance in Poor Things garners as much awards as she has won? I don't care for Emma Stone, but she did a good job. Great. She did a good job playing a three-year-old mentality, having somewhat of a character arc to the point that she was a Furs and Pearls girl at the very end. But... Nothing about this movie screams we should award this other than her showing her body. It's kind of like with La La Land. She sang and then she danced. Let's award her. And it's like you see her performances in Birdman and you're like, this woman can act her ass off. She can win these awards without being nude, without singing and dancing. But we're awarding her for these roles where she goes nude and sings and dances. And I don't like that portion of it. It's kind of like Margot Robbie. Margot Robbie will win an Academy Award once she stops doing these films that put her as the most beautiful face on the screen. All right. So boobs win the day. Final answer. Let's go from actress to supporting actress. The nominees for Best Actress in a Supporting Role are Emily Blunt, Oppenheimer, Danielle Brooks, The Color Purple, America Ferreira, Barbie, Jodie Foster, Nyad, and Divine Joy Randolph, The Holdovers. Do we want to talk about snubs for this category? I'll throw Patti Lupone into the mix for her performance as Mona in Bo is Afraid. Just piece of casting. Amazing. And Lupone's a fucking mo- master. I almost said monster. <laughs> she is a monster. Uh, but she's a master as well. I don't think she has more than 20 minutes of screen time, maybe less. But man, when she makes her appearance in the final act, I perked up. Oh, you got to the final act, huh? Mm, <laughs> yeah. Once we got to the woods, I I checked out. I don't blame you. It was tough. I, I mean, I checked out mentally. I was like watching images on my screen being like, what? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I had somebody tell me they think that might be their favorite movie ever joe lewis no was it joe lewis no. you wouldn't know this person they're a the the father of a friend very intelligent when it comes to the visual arts and cinema and they said they think it might be their favorite movie of all time i'm not gonna knock it because i love when people have favorite films but getting back to the stub question this would be julianne moore yeah not mm-hmm. Natalie Portman would be for lead actress, and I'm going to continue on that sailboat and say Julianne Moore was heavily snubbed in this one. 
I think we're both irritated, but I, I figured we were starting to annoy everybody with our May December fandom, so I scuttled it. I mentioned it when I was talking about Natalie Portman, but yeah, of course. I more should be up here. Who are we annoying? The people with the skip button? Feel free to use it. You think I want to hear my thoughts over and over again? You think I want it like a skip button over my own outrage at the May December travesty this year? Whoa. I would love it. All right. All right. But May December should be up there. If anything comes out of our Oscar podcasting for this year, is that May December was the biggest snubs. Agreed. Agreed. And even though it's been said far and wide, I'll say it one more time. American Ferrari <laughs> should not have been nominated. You know it. I know it. She knows it. We'll say Greta Gerwig's writing was good enough to get her nominated. So who has no chance in hell? Pretty much everybody except the favorite. And the favorite has always been Divine Joy Randolph from The Holdovers. I had you got stuck with babysitting duty this year. How'd you manage that? Oh, I don't know. I suppose I failed someone who richly deserved it. Oh, the Oz good kid. Yeah, he was a real asshole. Rich and dumb. Popular combination around here. It's a plague. Uh, and you? You'll be here too? I'll buy my lonesome. My little sister Peggy and her husband invited me to go visit them at Roxbury, but I feel like it's too soon. Like Curtis will think that I'm abandoning him, you know? This is the last place that my baby and I were together. Not including the bus station. Mm. Well, I look forward to your fine cooking. Oh, no, no, don't do that. Who do we want to win? I'll be happy for Randolph if she wins. I don't have much vested interest in this category. I thought she and Giamatti together were all the best parts of the holdovers. A couple of sad sack drunks. I was concerned for Randolph's character in that film, too. I was very worried that something bad was going to happen to her uh, by her own hand. And I'm set, like, I'm fine if Randolph wins this one. Yeah, it, it doesn't, it, 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 I, I don't know. Yeah, it's fine. Okay, let's move <laughs> on. Uh, nominees for actor in a supporting role are Sterling K. Brown for American Fiction, Robert De Niro for Killers of the Flower Moon, Robert Downey Jr. for Oppenheimer, Ryan Gosling for Barbie, and Mark Ruffalo for Poor Things. Snubs for this category? I think you have a snub. I mean, <laughs> Charles Melton. Last time I'm going to bring up May, December. He was great, and he actually added some credibility to the terrible television shows that my uh, wonderful wife watches. Sorry, honey. Another snub, much less publicized than Melton, I think would be Glenn Howerton from Blackberry. He was fantastic. Well, Sterling K. Brown did very little in American fiction. He's my biggest surprise in here. I think we should talk about Ryan Gosling and the meme joke of, this is what Barbie was about. A whole show about empowering women, and then it's Ryan Gosling that gets nominated. I get it. It's funny. But when everybody was walking out of Barbie that I was talking to, they couldn't stop talking about how much they loved Ryan Gosling in the role. So when he steals the show and then steals the nomination, I, to me, I was like, why is everyone surprised at this? I'm happy that Mark Ruffalo is on here. I think he should win. I don't know why Robert Downey Jr. is the darling. In fact, I think there's a thing we need to acknowledge. When an actor is given too much publicity and attention and work, I think, personally, their star dims. And I'd argue that the Marvel Universe is what are creating these time bomb supernovas. The less makeup you wear for those shows, the less CGI, the worse for you. Hence, Mark actually might have a chance, but the Downey Juniors, the Chris Evanses, the Anthony Mackies, and aside from Marvel, the Tom Hankses, the Chris Pratts, the Ryan Reynolds, the DiCaprios, like, these people can be at the top of the box office and they can reap millions in paychecks. But I'd be very surprised if they could pull off prestigious award performances. I would be shocked if they could be in a movie from henceforth and make me forget that I'm watching Chris Evans, that I'm watching Chris Pratt. And so all throughout Oppenheimer, I watched Robert Downey Jr. on the screen playing a man with gray hair. I figured he was going to be nominated because it's Robert Downey Jr., but this isn't, I don't think this is an Oscar-worthy performance. And I, to me now, he's Iron Man. So you think his previous career has kept him from being able to do anything else convincingly? Convincingly. Because of how much he's done and how much some other celebrities have done. They're over? It's kind of, it's not necessarily that they're over. Like I said, they could be in the biggest box office movies of the year. But as far as winning the best award, it's what we're running into when it comes to Meryl Streep and the Streep effect. There are things that she does in every single movie. So you can't say that she completely encapsulated the character when she's doing Streep things on camera. 
Leonardo DiCaprio's voice is going to crack in every fucking role that he plays. <laughs> And you're going to remember what Leonardo DiCaprio looked like in Romeo and Juliet and in Titanic because he has that same voice inflection that for whatever reason he can't get away from. Except, look at that. He wins an Oscar for what? The movie that he can't fucking form a vowel in because his throat was slashed by a bear. And so I think, like, when it comes to these actors, sorry, not sorry, considering the fact that they're fucking on top of the world, they're like one percenters, you can't win the Academy Award because you're not going to completely transform yourself. All right. So Rob Downey, pack it in. Could Rob Downey be the host of the Oscars? Then? That would that please fuck you? yeah. <laughs> he'd be a pretty good. He'd be a pretty good host, actually. And I love him, and I want to see him in. Like, I just don't think he needs an award that he probably doesn't care about in the long run. And he might care about it a little because he hasn't won one. But I think when you get to a certain age, your best work is behind you. Way better said than what I just went on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so our DJ is going to win this one, but I want Mark Ruffalo. What about Matt Damon? We never got a chance to talk about Matt Damon and Oppenheimer. Okay, go. <laughs> why is Nolan trying to make Damon happen? <laughs> yeah, why? That's a great question. I mean, Damon already happened. You know what, though? God damn it. If my old friend from Arizona still listens to this show, he is going to be upset. And he unironically loves Goodwill Hunting. And every year that passes, I hate it more and more. I fucking hate <laughs> that movie. Oh, man. I'm at a loss to come up with a truly good Matt Damon performance. I haven't seen Talented Mr. Ripley since I saw it in the theater, so maybe I should revisit it. Not if you're on a hate spell. <laughs> I don't mind. I like Matt Damon, and I really liked that era when Matt Damon was stealing action movies from Mark Wahlberg. Born Identity was a Mark Wahlberg film, but Matt Damon just kind of like swooped in and took it. And I think he did a well, good job with the Jason Bournes. Yeah. I like Goodwill Hunting. I like Talented Mr. Ripley. But anytime he appears in a Nolan film, he is a sore thumb. Oh, God. Interstellar. <laughs> I mean, that is the worst one, right? Yeah. But even Oppenheimer. I See, I think he's better in Oppenheimer. There's so many other people that show up in Oppenheimer that should kind of like throw you for a loop. And they're like bit roles. Yeah, the, the, the kid from uh, Adam's Family Values, David David Crumholtz. But I mean, like Josh Hartnett, yeah. you know, shows up and you're like, well, Joshy, where have you been? Yeah. You go, eh, but you you know it's going to be an Academy Award film and suddenly Josh Hartnett's there. But even so, Josh Hartnett blends in with the film and that Matt Damon comes to try and like crack some jokes and bring levity and you're like, Matt Damon, oh, fuck. <laughs> and then Casey Affleck shows up and you're like, oh yeah, Casey it's... Affleck is such a good actor. I forgot about that. Mm -hmm. So many, Rami Malek, like he was in, but Matt Damon, fucking Matt Damon, man. And he's my sister's favorite actor of all time. Favorite of all time. Wow. Have you ever heard of the movie Fat Man and Little Boy? I've heard of that, yeah. Named for the two bombs. Oh, yeah. Okay. Paul Newman played that role, that very same role before Damon. Not a good movie. Oppenheimer's a better movie than Fat Man and Little Boy. But yeah, Damon dared. He dared to step into a role already played by Paul Newman. And then he played it like Matt Damon. He did. Well, all historical reports point to that guy being very Matt Damon-y. <laughs> all right. Who do we want to win? You said Ruffalo. I, I'm i just going to I'm gonna say Rob De Niro. I think it's some of his best work. It, it is not some of his. It's his best work in a long time. I, I think he was great in Irishman. We don't have to get into that again because I know you're not a huge fan. I tried to watch it again. That fucking de-aging, though. Yeah, I guess I can look past it. I can look past that, but the way it bothers you is the way Joseph Gordon-Levitt in Looper bothers me. Just ruined. Agreed. The, I can't watch it. Yeah. And it's such a good story. And I like how they're like, ooh, with this new technology, we should come up with like this new way of doing things. When just fucking casting lookalikes <laughs> worked for a hundred years, just do that, you know? I mean, I saw somebody that took first DH scenes of De Niro. He's driving the meat truck around and they used deep fake. They superimposed De Niro circa 1990. Goodfellas De Niro. And it looks a thousand times better. Obviously, you're still going to have, if it's his body that you've deep faked the face onto, you're still going to have the old man body moving, but it looks way better. I guess the story and the themes were just so powerful that I, that I overlooked it. Or maybe I just give Martin Scorsese a pass. I don't know. Yeah. I'd bet on the latter. <laughs> Speaking of Scorsese, you want to talk best director? Let's talk best director. 
Nominees for Best Director are Jonathan Glazer for The Zone of Interest, Yorgos Lanthimos for Poor Things, Christopher Nolan for Oppenheimer, Martin Scorsese for Killers of the Flower Moon, and Justine Triette for Anatomy of a Fall. How about some snubs in this category? Once Yorgos was nominated, I was fine with this category. Yorgos and Nolan. Those are your horses? Yeah, well, those are the ones that once I got done watching everything for the year, I was like... Those I could see. Yorgos mainly, I mean, I think about our conversation with Jeremy a whole lot now when thinking about directors and style, Aww. style specifically. We'll get him back on the show, don't worry. I think that's the one of the most listened to episodes. So once I was watching Poor Things, I was like, well, you can't deny that there's style here. Like, this is probably the most stylized movie that I've seen in the theaters this year. And so I was glad that the Academy recognized that. And then with Nolan, I will say, I mean, I chat on Nolan a lot. I do not like his scripts. Uh, before I say that, I want to say Memento is one of the greatest top 30 scripts written of all time. And so I think his best, one of his best written scripts is Interstellar. It's not one of my favorite movies, but I think he had a really good limited series there that he made into a movie, which was a mistake. Tenet was, wasn't done yet. Like he took that out of the oven too early. Interesting. Then we have Inception, which is where I started noticing Nolan's flaw. I think it's around page 84 in Inception when they're like, well, what are we going to do? And suddenly they're like, we could do Mr. And they give a name and they're like, what's Mr. It's a dumb fucking idea. But they're completely just introducing what is going to save the whole thing on page 84 right before they do it. And that is such first level fuckery of writing that it's astounding that he doesn't get more shit for it. And we're going to talk to them on air or whatnot, but the revisionist almanac put Inception as like the greatest film of 2010. I will say that's of all of Nolan's films. And I've seen, I saw Memento in the theater. I did not see Insomnia. Didn't look interesting to me. Then I ended up renting it and I was right. I skipped the prestige, rented it, and I'm glad I skipped it. But I've seen absolutely everything else he's ever made in the theater. And Inception is not only my favorite experience of his in the theater, it's like top 10 theater experiences. There was a moment in during that movie where I was just Google-eyed staring at the screen like, wow. And my wife squeezed my hand and I looked at her and then I looked back at the screen and then I looked at her again and she's staring at me with this big dumb smile on her face. And I was like, what? And she just shrugged and I'm like, are you just like in awe of what the fuck you're seeing right now? And she just nods. It was adorable. Like just, I don't know. Nice memory. Mr. Charles is what they randomly come up with on like page 86. See, and that's, that's like when I think back to the actual script, it's like they were in the snow at some point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can poke a lot of holes in it, unfortunately. And people have, and they have uh, systematically kind of ruined it for me, unfortunately. So to get back to the topic at hand. Yes, please. I walked out of Oppenheimer. I have already admitted that I fell asleep. I Best picture. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about this fucking year, man. I enjoyed the movie. I enjoyed the, histor hit the history of the movie. I greatly enjoyed seeing Albert Einstein being played like a regular person, which I don't think I've seen very often. And I was like, he's a historical figure that you very rarely see in motion. So I like that. And I walked out and I was like, you know what, though? I can admit that that is very fine filmmaking. And if I had to sit through the Dunkirks and the Inceptions and the Interstellars and everything to get to Oppenheimer, I'm fine if we go, that was it. That was your masterpiece, Nolan, moving on. You know, so that's what I kind of think the 2023 Oscars are going to be about is here's your comeuppance, Nolan. Bring on Deadpool and Wolverine. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, I'm actually kind of excited. I never thought I would be, but I'm sort of excited to see that. Well, as far as snubs are concerned, I'll throw out two, starting with Celine Song. And I, I, she had to have been close to being in this category, but got axed because Past Lives just doesn't have that same electricity as these other directors brought to their films. It's a far more quietly confident film, and the, but the visuals are there. It's engaging and it's subtle, and I really would have loved for her to get a nod. This is one of two movies you and I agree wholeheartedly on this year. I didn't cry, though. You said I'd cry, and I didn't, but it was that final tracking shot of her walking away from the uber 
I mean, there's so many moments like that. It's kind of one of those things where the Academy Awards, I'm like, how, why are you thinking you know more than the Directors Guild Awards? You know, like, look at what they brought to the table. Christopher Nolan wins for Oppenheimer. He's up against Yorgos, Alexander Payne for The Holdovers, and Martin Scorsese for Killers, and Greta Gerwig for Barbie. So that's who the Directors Guild put up for their top five. But Celine Song wins First Time Feature Film Director. That would be an awesome award to add to the Academy Awards. Mm -hmm. I'll also throw out Ari Aster. And I'll admit wholeheartedly that Bo's Afraid is an imperfect movie. It is maybe the most indulgent movie I've ever seen. It's polarizing to audiences. It was polarizing to me. I think it's supposed to be. But you cannot deny the sheer magnitude of vision of this movie. I think the first hour and a half, you and I both agree, was amazing. I would say it's some of the best filmmaking I saw all year. And I'm also kind of excited to see how he bounces back from this one, because it was a colossal failure. And uh, I've said it on the show before, so I don't want to repeat myself, but I think out of all (laughs) the directors that could win best directing for a horror film it's Ari Aster so Nolan's gonna win Mm -hmm. Nolan's gonna win why does Nolan deserve this he doesn't but he's gonna win (laughs) 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 I don't know I you could probably make an argument that he put the most work in does he have the most style no that's Yorgos did he pull off the most competent film no that's Celine song but he put the most work in so we're gonna award it He didn't use CGI. Great. All right. Let's talk about the screenplay awards, starting with Best (laughs) Original Screenplay. The nominees are Justine Trier and Arthur Harari for Anatomy of a Fall. David Hemmingson for The Holdovers. Bradley Cooper and Josh Singer, Maestro. Sammy Birch, May, December. And Celine Song, Past Lives. I feel like I'm being like negative this episode. So like instead of being negative right out of the gate for this, I'm just going to ask you a very pointed question. Why does everybody like the holdovers so much? I don't. I don't. <laughs> I, don't I, I don't know. I think it's a very serviceable movie. I also don't think it does anything that I haven't seen done before, nor do I think there's anything particularly special about it. But you know what I will say? In, in <laughs> Since you're like trying to be more positive, I will say this. It did make me remember what I liked about teaching. Oh, well, that's a good compliment. And God damn it. Paul Giamatti. Paul Giamatti always. What a, what a, what a, just a sweetheart of a man. I mean, he has to be. If he's not, I don't want to live in this world anymore. <laughs> Copy that. I didn't necessarily like the holdovers, but I think what I liked the least about the holdovers was the script. And I think one of the reasons why that is the case is because all the characters to me sounded the same. When it came to their lines, it felt like Paul Giamatti was speaking every single line. Like the script was written for Paul Giamatti in mind, it seemed like, and they couldn't get away from that voice with the other characters. Some actors were a lot better at masking it, but not the youngest of the children, I don't think. I think it's the most clear when the one actor has his glove thrown into the lake that whole scene and every line that they are delivering in that sounded like it could be coming from Paul Giamatti's mouth and that's when I really picked up on it and was like I don't like this screenplay and then come Oscar nomination day I was like holy shit this got a lot of noms am I just kind of wrong but reading over the script now and just looking at it to me this script needed another pass so that every character sounded differently To me. And then Maestro. Maestro is my reason for hating the Oscars this year. There's no reason that Maestro should have any of these nominations, I don't think, other than Carey Mulligan. I can stomach the other three. It's funny because, like, any of the other three, I'm happy with winning. And then Holdovers and Maestro, I'm like, I'm going to punch myself in the thigh if they do. (laughs) So dramatic. (laughs) Does anybody want to watch the Oscars with me? I'll discuss a snub. Guarantee I'm going to say this and you're going to disagree with me and then go on a 20-minute rant about why I'm wrong. But let's do it anyway. Um, I, I, I think uh, How to Blow Up a Pipeline is a wonderful script. It, it feels like somebody who intensely loved Reservoir Dogs wrote a script, but I'm not mad at it. I, I thought it was, it unfolded in such a cool way. 
A lot of the acting is good. A lot of the acting is not so good. But I think it's the screenplay of that movie. It bums me out that because it's independent, we don't get to see it get any kind of recognition here at the Oscars. And you know what? I like it better than Maestro and I like it better than The Holdovers. It was written by Ariella Bearer, Jordan Scholl, and Daniel Goldhaber. Just to give a little credit and probably I butchered their names. So a little credit, but... I think the problem of it getting to the Academy Awards stage is the reviews against it were saying, you know, that it was promoting eco-terrorism and everything like that. It's incendiary, but fuck that. Who cares? Fuck that. Isn't that what art sometimes is supposed to be? You know, it's supposed to wake you up. You could do the the happy-go-lucky, we can all laugh at it at the same time discussing climate crisis through Don't Look Up, which was an awards darling. Or you could do something like How to Blow Up a Pipeline, which was a lot more thrilling and probably taught you a lot more just by being in your face. I really like this nomination, my friend. Holy shit. Very cool. So who's going to win right now? It looks like a two-horse race between Anatomy of a Fall and The Holdovers. And it's likely going to go to Anatomy of a Fall. But anything could happen. What do you want to see win? Out of these, I'm fine. I'm probably my one-two is past. Well, no, I would want to see May-December. Yeah, May-December for me too. Moving on. (laughs) The other screenplay Oscar, Best Adapted Screenplay. The nominees are Cord Jefferson for American Fiction. Greta Gerwig and Noah Baumbach for Barbie, Tony McNamara for Poor Things, Christopher Nolan for Oppenheimer, and Jonathan Glazer for The Zone of Interest. Any snubs you want to discuss? I want to talk about people's reaction to snubs, if we can, for a second, because there's no love. Look, general audience and people listening to us, writing a movie is fucking hard. And really, the whole movie-making process starts with the screenplay. The screenplay is the most important thing when it comes to a movie. It's got to be a good script. So when Greta Gerwig doesn't get her Best Director nomination, but she gets one for writing, let's not burn the world down because getting nominated for Best Writer is a fucking fantastic feat. Oh, did you feel marginalized? Oh my gosh, did I ever. Uh, And you know who else was complaining about it? Bro. (laughs) My entire... So the first semester of my grad school is all about how, you know, my professor feels slighted when every time they're talking about a movie, it's like a Hitchcock movie, but it's never like the writer's movie, even though it was the writer's idea and the writer's words on the page that brought it all to fruition. I'm not talking about her reaction, but everybody in the class was like, yeah, one for the writers. And I would say 70% of my classmates were the ones that were like, Greta Gerwig wasn't nominated for director and da-da-da. I was like, but she was nominated for, like, that's great that she was nominated for, no, it wasn't even, it didn't even matter to them. Like, this is the reason why I started my Academy Awards pool so my family would care about the writing awards. I don't know why nobody cares about the writing awards. Maybe because writers aren't as cool as directors and actors. But regardless, this goes to Oppenheimer. Well, I didn't ask who you thought it would go to, but thank you for sharing. (laughs) I was going to ask, don't you think, though, that the reason people were so up in arms that Greta didn't get nominated was because the film was so successful, both critically and commercially. And directors are typically the, the men. So I think writing is sort of an androgynous position, wouldn't you agree? I mean, I still think it's dominated mostly by men as we look at both of these categories, but (laughs) there feels some more androgyny in writing, less so in directing, wouldn't you say? Well, the weird thing is, is when Hollywood first got started, 50% of all movies were written by women because women could hide in that role. But no, I wouldn't say it's androgynous. It's still a male-dominated field. Okay. People just don't care about writers. I care about writers. Thank you, buddy. Well, some writers. (laughs) So you already mentioned that you think Oppenheimer's going to win. Mm, yes. I think this might be one of the big ones that it doesn't get. I'm going to go out on a limb. I'm surprised that Jonathan Glazer's zone of interest is up, considering from what I've heard, a lot of what occurs on screen is impromptu. To me, it was an hour and 40 minute movie that was an hour and 10 minutes too long. Like zone of interest was a short <laughs> Interesting. How about Poor Things? You've made your thoughts known on American Fiction and Barbie, but how about Poor Things as a script? Well, here's the funny thing about this. So the only movie that I would say wasn't too long was American Fiction. Like I said, I didn't really like Barbie. Poor Things was 15 minutes too long. Oppenheimer was 30 minutes too long. The Zone of Interest was an hour too long. American Fiction had a good run. It was very engaging until the third act when I thought it got sloppy, when it got meta. And I was like, oh, okay, so we didn't really know what to do here. So we just got cute. 
And Barbie Barbie was just adapted from a doll. It doesn't belong in this in this category. I think it's a very strange category, but it's an existing IP. I read the rule and, and, and then forgot it immediately. But according to the Academy's rule, this is the category it belongs in. It's like Clue, if Clue was nominated. It was based off a board game. So Yeah, probably. What a dumb board game, but great movie. <laughs> well, I only have one more question for you before we move away from these two screenplay awards. And I don't need anything more from you than a yes or a no. Have you read any of these 10 nominated scripts? Yes. Which one? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so out of these 10, I read The Holdovers. I read partly of Past Lives. I have read Barbie. And that's it. Do you think you're ahead of the curve on that one as far as the members of the Academy are concerned? For sure. Really? Absolutely. I'd love to hear from some writers and not writer directors. Chris Nolan's not reading any of these scripts, but I'd like to hear from somebody like Tony McNamara and be like, hey, did you read any of these other scripts that Poor Things is up against? I feel like he would. And really, you know, no shade, but I feel like Greta wouldn't and Noah would. I bet Greta read Past Lives and May December. It's been a pretty big year for Greta. I would I would cut her some slack. I cut nobody slack. Oh, no, you sure <laughs> fucking don't. <laughs> Have you read any of these? No. Fuck no. I don't care about writers. Kyle from I Know Movies and You Don't went, I love the fact that you make Lee read the screenplays. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. Best International Feature. The nominees are... Io Capitano, I think, from Italy. Perfect Days from Japan. Society of the Snow from Spain. The Teacher's Lounge from Germany. And The Zone of Interest from the United Kingdom. So, Spro, in the past, you've said that if a film is nominated either here in Best International Feature or in Best Animated Feature, then it shouldn't also be permitted to compete for Best Picture. For example, this year, Zone of Interest is nominated both here and there. But there's really examples, like, from almost every subsequent year, especially the last, like, 10 years. What do you think? Are you, are you sticking to you, You're sticking to your guns on that, aren't you? Oh, of course I am. Put all your chips in one area. Like, have some balls in this whole process. If you think you have the best picture of the year, then put it there. And if you're like, I hope we have the best picture and the... Like, if you're going to be wishy-washy, fuck off. I stand by this. Animated, too. I don't think Up should have been up for best picture and best animated. And I think documentaries should be up for best picture. I don't know why they're not. But man, some documentaries, I think, are the most important films of the year. I've seen two of these before we... We get too deep into this discussion and i wanted to watch a third until i found out that it was uh, like over like four almost four and a half hours and i was like no 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 sounds like your kind of movie <laughs> Well, unfortunately, I am right down to my beer gut. I'm an American. And uh, as far as international films are concerned, they were put on the chopping block when I uh, started running out of time. I do think because of the Best in the World episode that I am a believer in our own theory that usually some of the best work is not coming out of America anymore. So I am interested in seeing all five of these. I saw Society of the Snow. I enjoyed it. I'm sure it's better than Alive, which which was done by us back in the day. And that one is on Netflix. So if anybody wants to check it out, I suggest it. Which one did you want to see that's over four hours? The Teacher's Lounge. That one's the one that's over four hours? Pretty sure. I'll check them all out. And sooner or later, we'll do another Best in the World just because I think it's gratifying. Well, now I feel like I have to out of sheer American shame. But <laughs> who do you want to win of the ones that you saw? Not Zone of Interest. I didn't like that. Society of the Snow, no. It's funny, though, because I'm like looking at it like, who do I want to throw some props to? And I think Japan has been kind of at the top of the pile for a while since like Drive My Car and everything like that. So I would be interested just if Perfect Days won. I was reading the Io Capitano, and it's a... Like an Odyssey fable, which might be interesting, too. Nice. Yeah, I, I wasn't impressed with, with Zone of Interest, and Society of the Snow was fine. I didn't lose my shit over it like everybody else did. I think Society of the Snow might win, though. Really? Based on your criticisms of the Academy for being short-sighted and, and allowing themselves to be easily swayed by campaigns, Society of the Snow has Netflix money behind it. Right. And a lot of people were able to see it. Right. I mean, like, based off, like, the, my previous theory, like, I think it's going to be Zone of Interest just because it was nominated for Best Picture as well. So it's kind of like, we're not going to give you this. We'll give you this. I see. And what, who was it? There was some host that looked at Kate Winslet and was like, I told you, you do a Holocaust movie. You get the awards. Do you remember <laughs> this? Was it Ricky Gervais? Yeah, it was. Zone of Interest is a Holocaust movie. All right. 
Well, speaking of best animated feature, that's the next one on the docket. The nominees are The Boy and the Heron, Elemental, Nimona, Robot Dreams, which I, I've never even seen a poster for, and Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. And if there's a snub for this category, I don't know. I kind of like Mutant Mayhem. <laughs> I'm with you. I'm with you on that one. I want to see The Boy and the Heron. I can't figure out where to see it, but it seems like the favorite to win, which is kind of out of left field. I don't know. I don't know how out of left field it is. It's a Miyazaki film, and it's more than likely going to be his last. So he has one Oscar, right, for Spirited Away. So this will be his second if he wins. The first Spider-Man, Spider-Verse movie won. So I enjoyed Nimona. I very much enjoyed Nimona. I wish I could show it to my kids, but I think she's a little too pushing the line to show middle graders. Eh, maybe. Yeah, I don't... And Spider-Man I really liked. Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, I would be happy if it, that was nominated for Best Picture. But nobody can deny that Sony did something different with their animation in these Spider-Man movies. Oh, absolutely. The first, I mean, I don't know. I, the second one didn't wow me quite so much as the first one did. I did see the first one in the theater, and I didn't see the second one in the theater. But it's like seeing the girl of your dreams naked for the second time. You're like, yeah, it's still really great, but it was really good the first time. <laughs> right? No? Yes? I don't know. That's the way I felt. All right. Let's talk about <laughs> Best Documentary Feature. The nominees are Bobby Wine, The People's President, The Eternal Memory, Four Daughters, To Kill a Tiger, and 20 Days in Maripol. Bobby Wine is on Disney Plus for anybody that wants to watch it. It was a good watch. I don't know. I really like documentaries. They're just very hard to find. And there was one of my producers was part of the team that brought, I think it's called Documentary Plus. It was a streaming service for documentaries. And I think that has since folded. I think it only lasted about three years. Not a big market for documentaries out there. 20 Days in Maripol is probably going to win just because it's a sort of frontline issue. Some pretty harrowing footage of the war in Ukraine. It bums me out that Best Documentary Feature has become basically just an Oscar for for left-wing politics. Is that a fair thing to say? Well, one, yeah, I knew nothing about 20 Days in Maripol. That makes sense. Because the Academy does have political moments. It's one of the reasons why you stopped liking it so much, because everybody had to voice their opinion when they got the award that they worked all their life for. And usually the opinion is for something that's very temporary. So it'll be interesting. It'll be interesting. I've been very good at not watching any media and knowing nothing going on. So I will clock every time something comes up at the Academy Awards that I go, didn't know that shit was happening, <laughs> you know? Because people who are rich and famous want to tell us their ideas and opinions on shit. I mean, I don't know what any of these are. But like, I know Bobby Wine, the people's president, was pretty good. It was like if Tupac Shakur ran for president. It was a recording artist that could generate a whole lot of appeal for his like people's people party, power to the people running for president because of his artistry. Hmm. So that was interesting. Next on the list <laughs> is Best Cinematography. Your nominees are El Conde. Killers of the Flower Moon, Maestro, Oppenheimer, and Poor Things. I don't have any snubs to discuss for this category. I'm not going to sit here and, and measure up who has no chance in hell. Who do I think is going to win and who do I want to win is Rodrigo Prieto for Killers of the Flower Moon. It might be the only award that Killers of the Flower Moon wins. I think the race between Lily Gladstone and Emma Stone is pretty close right now, but... I could see this being the only one that it wins. Unfortunately, I think it's going to go to Oppenheimer. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to throw it out there. El Condi. I would really like to see El Condi take this one home. Ed Lockman is the cinematographer for that film. It is available on Netflix right now. We talk a lot about how the Academy does not praise horror films. And this is a straight, it's not a straight horror film. It's not like Jason running through the woods or Freddy invading your nightmares. But it is a vampire movie through and through where they're ripping out people's hearts and putting them in blender and eating them and whatnot. It's all shot in black and white, yet you can feel like you can see the redness of the blood wherever. And there are some really cool scenes of people flying around in fields when they don't know how to fly and whatnot that to me, it's beautiful. It reminded me of watching Crouching Tiger, Hidden, and Dragon way back in the day when all of the wire work was completely new and we were watching people sword fight at the top of treetops. So El Condi was one that I didn't even watch until about a week ago. And then I was like, oh my gosh, knew nothing about it. And suddenly they're talking about vampires. And I was like, really? Academy? Oh, good job. Doesn't have a shot in hell. 
But I've talked a lot about this episode where I said the Academy has a lot of uninspired picks. And so it's these like little ones that get snuck through that I really want to pay attention to. Cool. I'll add it to my list. Sounds good. Next, best editing. This is your favorite, right, Spro? The three most important awards, best writing, best directing, best editing. Them's the people that makes the best picture. Fair enough. The nominees are Anatomy of the Fall, The Holdovers, Killers of the Flower Moon, Oppenheimer, and Poor Things. What do we think is going to win versus what do we want to see win? I think Oppenheimer's going to win this, but I would like anatomy of a fall to win this i would also be okay if thelma schoonmaker took home another one for killers of the flower moon yeah if we ever want to do a thelma schoonmaker appreciation episode absolutely that woman needs to be praised more you said anatomy of a fall i'd like to see anatomy of a fall win do you remember like any like scenes or what like when you're like oh my gosh like Uh, i think the way the the film is cut together does a good job of keeping the the mystery going Lots of reaction shots. The boy playing the piano. I mean, I couldn't even tell the kid was blind for the first 15 minutes of the movie. I was like, what's with his eyes? <laughs> I didn't even notice his eyes. Oh, really? It didn't even register. What's with your eyes? <laughs> My contacts, man. I'm with you full-fledged in this episode, in your opinion. I would like Anatomy of a Fall. I think it's going to be Oppenheimer. I'm fine with Schoonmaker taking it. Yeah, I think just simply by virtue of the fact that who knows how much film Scorsese shot on Killers of the Flower Moon. I mean, all of his movies are just so massive. And then it's up to her to sort of chisel the story out. It's quite an undertaking. Um, I will throw in just a slight barb. If the movie is three hours long, somebody probably could have edited a little bit more. Um, oh, all right. This movie, that movie's too long. Well, Thelma, if you're listening, it's too long. Spro oh, thinks he can do your job better. <laughs> Best costume design. Your nominees are Barbie, Killers of the Flower Moon, Napoleon, Oppenheimer, and Poor Things. So the 40s were 80 years ago. Killers of the Flower Moon took place, was it the 20s? Maybe. I mean, you're getting a little bit closer with that, but still, it's like, they're just wearing suits. I mean, Killers of the Flower Moon at least brings in a different culture other than white people. Oppenheimer's just a bunch of white people in suits and dresses. Why does it deserve a nomination for costume design? I don't get it. I don't. I, I, I don't. Because Killian Murphy pulled his fucking pants up to his nipples? How do you costume design Barbie? Do you just go to Target and, like, buy 20 Barbies off the shelf and go, it's going to look like this? I think the costume <laughs> design in that movie was not only executed very very well and vibrant and colorful and fun to look at but every time she like threw out an outfit they did the freeze frame and it told you like the year that it originated that shit was fucking rad i never had a barbie in my life and i considered beginning a collection you did say at the beginning of this episode that i was going to rub my nipples I am going to rub my nipples all over all my new Barbies that I'm going to go buy. And I kind of want to like put in the sound clip of you talking about Black Panther and being like, I mean, it's just all, it's just, isn't it just like right there? And then you just put it on the screen. Like that's, that's Barbie. Like it's all been designed before and you just put it on the screen. So who's going to win? Barbie. I think so. Who do you think should win? Out of these five? You're right. Killers of the Flower Moon, Oppenheimer. It's just going to the thrift store. Barbie's just going to Target. I guess Poor Things. Poor Things is probably like the most original. Yeah. The person had to do some time period piece, but also look at steampunk and just kind of try and figure out Yorgos's idea. I would be okay with that. I guess we found some middle ground, folks. All right, moving on. Best hair and makeup. The nominees are Golda. Maestro, (laughs) Oppenheimer, Poor Things, Society of the Snow. Now, (laughs) you want to go right to Maestro? Does the Academy not read its own trades? Like The man said, and by the man I mean Bradley Cooper, said the following, and this isn't verbatim, but it's close. He said, every day he felt the ghost of Leonard Bernstein enter him. Like, And I didn't hear him say it. I just read an article. So he may have been saying it with like a goofy smile on his face, but Jesus Christ. The worst thing he did with the movie Maestro is put in the real life picture of Bernstein at the end to show you that he looked nothing fucking like (laughs) the real person. Even though he tried his damnedest to be the person, like, I don't understand. Well, he was in there. Leonard was in there. (laughs) 
Yeah, no. Fuck Maestro. Yeah. Um, gold is another one. It's just like, I'm I, I'm tired of giving hair and makeup to be like, oh my god, they sure did look like that person. Wow, they really got it. And I'm not sure. Can you tell me why Oppenheimer's up here? I, I would say the only two that impressed me would be Poor Things and Society of the Snow. And I would go straight to Society of the Snow. Like, Poor Things had some cool makeup to some of the characters, but Society of the Snow, everybody in that movie was done up and in a chronological way you mean to show their sort of degradation yeah i'm, I'm down with that i mean i looked at william defoe and i was like oh it's william defoe with scars willem, on his willem willem, willem defoe i looked at william defoe and i was like oh my gosh <laughs> it's willem defoe Will, what the fuck are you talking willem willem willem, willem. i looked at willow willow okay. defoe <laughs> I looked at Defoe. Oh, there you go. <laughs> oh, Work around. I looked at Mr. Defoe and uh, looked like him with scars on his face, and the scars looked real, and that's great, you know? But I think Society of the Snow, as it went along, I wasn't thinking about the makeup. I wasn't thinking about any of that stuff. It was just a part of the movie, and I think that's kind of... You shouldn't really notice these things. I'd be okay with either one of those, but I think you just sold me on Society of the Snow. It's going to go to Maestro. <laughs> <laughs> Do you really think so? I don't know. I have no idea. Probably Golda, just because it's the only nomination they threw its way. All right, let's move on before we really get in trouble. Best sound. The nominees are The Creator, Maestro, Mission Impossible, Dead Reckoning Part 1, Oppenheimer, and The Zone of Interest. I think this one kind of has to go to Oppenheimer. I think this is a good category other than Maestro. Because what do they say? Maestro, the orchestra sounded like an orchestra when every fucking movie nominated for an Oscar this year had an orchestra setting in it. I don't understand that award. The zone of interest, the most interesting thing about the zone of interest was the sound. Pretty much, when I say it was an hour and ten minutes too long, if you haven't seen the movie, it's pretty much the ordinary life of the person that lives next to Auschwitz. And so you're just watching these people throw garden parties and stuff like that while you're hearing screaming and stuff on the other side of the wall. Super interesting, but not for a hundred minutes. Oppenheimer walking out of it, I told people, I was like, you have to see it in the theater because of the sound. When the talking gets too long and boring, suddenly he thinks about Ab- and you're fucking deaf. So it was a very interesting piece to throw in there for Nolan. And I think he knew because it was a very talky talk movie. It is nice to see a couple of movies on here that aren't action movies. Because the best sound back when it was best sound and best sound effects editing before they combined them into this one, it was just dominated by movies like Mission Impossible, Dead Reckoning, or The Creator. Two very serviceable action films that didn't really break any new ground. Just rattle your nuts while you're sitting in the theater. So Right. Sound is one of those things where I marvel at the feet of sound. And it's another one of those awards that people just don't seem to care about too much. So we both think Oppenheimer's going to win. Yep. All right. Moving on. Next. But oh. I would say Zone of Interest should have gotten it. Fair enough. Moving on. Best visual effects. The nominees are The Creator, Godzilla Minus One, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, Mission Impossible, Dead Reckoning Part 1, and Napoleon. Je suis Napoleon. I don't really have, I, I mean, none of this stuff impresses me anymore. I'm a grumpy old man and other things besides like, wow, whoa. <laughs> none of that shit really blows my mind anymore. Godzilla minus one was made for $1 million. And I think because of what they pulled off, it should go right to that one. Now that we got best casting as a category coming up, either best stunts or best practical effects needs to happen. Because best visual effects, best these visual effects, best CGI, I don't care. You know, like, and really, this is a hindsight award, considering the fact that what's going to still look good in 10 years, you know? Lord of the Rings looks fucking phenomenal. Jurassic World, you can already see the cracks. So, it's hard to even, like, pick. It's funny, too, because the original Spider-Man, that was 2001, Mm -hmm. same year as Fellowship of the Ring. And that shit's bad. Is it? I mean, I thought it was bad when I first saw it. But yeah, him, like, when he first realizes that he can shoot jism, and he's like, whoa, 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 I'm Tobey Maguire, whoa, whoa. He looks like Judge Doom when he gets flattened by the by the steamroller <laughs> and then stands up. 
It's bad. It's weird, too, that, like, Spielberg can't top Jurassic Park. You know, like, Ready Player One and stuff like that. Like, Jurassic Park is just a feat in effects. It still looks pretty good. It still does. Still holds up. Agreed. I'm surprised Napoleon got nominated for awards. You and I tried to watch it. One time. It's just too much about him and his wife. And as much as I love Vanessa Kirby, I, I don't care about Napoleon getting cucked by his wife. Well, and I don't think like Ridley Scott knew what movie he would like. Did he want to talk about Napoleon the general or Napoleon the husband? Like he just wants to make movies. That's why he's out there being like, well, I've made four movies in the time that it took Scorsese to make one. So and it's like, yeah, but Scorsese made a good one and you made mostly bad ones. Well, and you just made Ridley Scott sound more European. European than he made Napoleon sound. So, all right. Yeah, I'm okay with Godzilla minus one. Ooh, I'm ready to talk about best production design. The nominees are Barbie, Killers of the Flower Moon, Napoleon, Oppenheimer, and Poor Things. I hope this one goes to Barbie. I think the sets are tremendous. And when the Kens storm the beach, they're singing their song and it's in slow motion, but not. And there's arrows flying past them that are clearly on strings. Fucking great. Fucking great. I was dying laughing. I hope Barbie wins. (laughs) Are you crying? I just, I can't, I can't with the Barbie, man. Um, oh, okay. Killers of the Flower Moon. There's a place down the street called Hale Farm that you could have shot Killers of the Flower Moon in, and it would have looked just the same. Napoleon, we were actually commenting on how beautiful it looked. And then I was surprised when I was looking up reviews and they're like, it's just shoddy. And I was like, oh, I actually kind of really like Napoleon. Oh, man. The opening sequence of Napoleon, I was like, Mm -hmm. this is going to be amazing. And that's what Ridley Scott does to me every time. I'm like, oh, dude, this one's okay. He's back to his old form. No, he's not. And then Napoleon was like, hello. (laughs) (laughs) I would say poor things. I don't know. I really like the steampunk. I think it was very creative. It was very outside of the box. And I think it also worked. It wasn't steampunk just for Zack Snyder to do steampunk. It was a different take on the Frankenstein storyline. And so it kept me engaged more than Emma Stone's performance. Best original song. The nominees are What Was I Made For by Billie Eilish from Barbie. I'm Just Ken by Mark Ronson and Andrew Wyatt from Barbie. The Fire Inside by Diane Warren from Flame and Hot, which I haven't seen, but I would really like to see. It Never Went Away by Jean Baptiste from American Symphony. And Wazazi, a song from my people by the Osage tribal singers from Killers of the Flower Moon. I'd like to see Billie Eilish and Phineas win for What Was I Made For. I think that song was the cherry on top for a couple scenes in that movie. Every time it's come on the radio, I've listened to it. And sometimes I've sought it out. (laughs) And it would be her second Oscar. But it would be the first one that she deserves. That's where my head's at. But the fun fact for this category is, this is Diane Warren's 15th Oscar nomination for Best Original Song. She received an honorary Oscar last year, so it's not too likely that she'll win this year, but who knows? The Fire Inside is definitely the catchiest song out of these five. If you listen to the Best Original Song episode, you'll realize that this is my least favorite category of the 23 Academy Awards. I could tell you The Fire Inside is the catchiest song. It Never Went Away sounds just like the Academy nominates every single year. It's a ballad that will never make your Spotify playlist at home. Wazazi is the Academy being like, we're so woke we knew what this song even was and so we're going to put it on the stage and like, fuck, like... God, we're so cynical. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Speaking of cynical, I'm just Ken. Oh, could you believe that they're going to have Ryan Gosling sing this song on the stage for no other reason than to get fucking watchers? And it's going to (laughs) work. And it is going to work. I'm glad that it's not Glenn Close doing the butt. It might make you nostalgic for that. (laughs) 
I don't know. I think like my favorite musical performance probably of all time is going to be Blame Canada. That's a good pick. But I don't think it's a long shot to say it's Billie Eilish's year for What Was I Made For. It's also you rubbing your nipples because that song <laughs> is just so blah. I don't know. Maybe it all hit me because I don't live in Arizona anymore. I've left the teaching profession for who knows how long. You know, maybe the heart of the whole reason I enjoyed Barbie so much is because it dealt with someone who felt lost and who was reaching beyond what they were supposed to be reaching beyond. The last time I had a poker night, MC sat there and talked about how much he resonated with Barbie. So glad it resonated for you guys. I wish it was a better movie. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Next, best original score. I like this category. I used to buy a lot of movie soundtracks, and they weren't the ones with a bunch of needle drops on them. I would go to sleep with, like, Jurassic Park soundtrack on, or Terminator 2 was one that I would play a lot. You're, like, snuggled in. (laughs) All right. um, Best original score. The nominees are American Fiction, Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny, Killers of the Flower Moon, Oppenheimer, and Poor Things. It's Oppenheimer. It's going to be Oppenheimer. As boring as that movie does get at points, it just assaults you with the sound (laughs) and the music. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. I don't listen so much. It wasn't until All Quiet on the Western Front where I was like, this score is fucking rocking me. Usually, I don't necessarily notice it. I'm surprised that you don't want one more for your Indiana Jones. I, I will say that Helena's theme actually grew on me. I really actually kind of like that song. It does not feel like, A, it belongs in an Indiana Jones movie, and B, it doesn't feel like kind of what John Williams has been doing the last 10, 15 years. I think the last great score he did was for the first couple of Harry Potter movies. He hasn't done much that's... It all feels very derivative of... Often of himself. Even the Harry Potter score occasionally feels derivative of himself. But Helena's theme is really good. If he won, dude, I, I would be ecstatic. John Williams is the soundtrack to my life. I'm actually surprised that there isn't more push for Robbie Robertson's score from Killers of the Flower Moon. Uh, it, yeah, I would always, I always love seeing posthumous Oscars. I think it's a nice tribute, maybe some closure for the family, closure for fans. But yeah, this, this is a year for Ludwig Göransson and, and the Oppenheimer score. I don't think there's any question about it. So what we've got next are the best live-action shorts, the best animated shorts, and the best documentary shorts. Now, Spro, you and I went and saw 10 of these, and my wife, uh, Lizzie, joined us. Best live-action shorts, the nominees are The After, Invincible, Night of Fortune, Red, White, and Blue, and The Wonderful Story of Henry Sugar. Now, I really liked two of these, Night of Fortune and The Wonderful Story of Henry Sugar. You did not care for Night of Fortune, and we don't need to go into the logistics of it all, but I, I just want to say that wonderful story of Harry, Henry Sugar is going to win. Are we at least in agreement of that? Yes. Okay. I would recommend to anyone who gives a flying fuck and is actually still listening to this, I would recommend that you find a friend who would accompany you and go to your local cinema and watch these because it's kind of fun. And I appreciate that we went and did that. And it's a nice little memory now that I have with you and me and Lizzie. Well, one, I I wish we had a better experience. I'm glad that you really enjoyed it. And I look forward to doing it every year with you. But I'm going to add to my list of complaints against movie theaters nowadays. One, the headrests are gross. Please wash them. Get some of the people's head oil off of them. Two, trailers way too long. And three now... My favorite theater, it's not temperature controlled. It was either dry your eyeballs out hot or it was freezing cold with an AC. So we got to work on the temperature environment. Also, I was like, dude, you're going to love it because between every movie, between every short, there's credits and there's a little bit of time so you can turn to your person that you're seeing the movie with and be like, did you like that one? What's your rating and everything like that? Our theater was so quiet it was like a library so i was turning to you and whispering but it was like it was it was serious business in there deadly serious yeah maybe high maybe maybe under the influence of something good for them um as far as my opinions about the shorts go henry sugar was just the biggest budget most well-crafted one and then i did like red white and blue um i know you didn't but we don't have to get into that and then also 
I really thought, I think the favorite to win is The After, which The I After, it, no, Henry Sugar is the favorite to win, but The After is high up there, and The After, to me, was melodramatic. Oh, so, so melodramatic. In fact, the favorite of this category, The After, and the favorite of the next category are both at the bottom of my list. All right, best animated short. The nominees are Letter to a Pig, 95 Senses, Our Uniform, Pachyderm, and War is Over, inspired by the music of John and Yoko. And the fucking favorite, as far as I can see, (laughs) is War is Over. And if, listener, if you've ever played any of the Telltale video games, these are the, like, not necessarily choose your own adventure, but you get to... You get to make decisions throughout. You get to choose what you want to say to someone who's speaking to you. You can be acidic, or you can be compassionate, or you can be indifferent. And then throughout the game, there are certain choices you can make. Like in the case of The Walking Dead, Telltale game, there's one moment where you get to choose, I can only save one person in this instance, so who continues with me in this story, and who dies? And of course, there's consequences either way. You can never truly make the quote-unquote right decision. But the animation has a look to it, like traced very hard as though it's a comic book moving in a different way than across the Spider-Verse movies. It looks like one of those games, which uh, I got no hate for it in in that respect. Okay, but like, what was your favorite film? Yeah, I would say my favorite from this is Letter to a Pig. I enjoyed that one. Letter to a Pig was probably the most disturbing for me. The one that I have talked about more so since we saw all of these is 95 Senses. It kind of opened my eyes up to how well we treat people on death row um, concerning like the last meal and everything (laughs) like that. Yeah, I think I'm actually kind of starting to move to that side of the belief. That we treat them too well? I don't want to be the one that ends people's lives, but... (sighs) <sighs> Sometimes you got to kill motherfuckers, you know? <laughs> no? Too dark? Um, okay. No, like, I don't think it's too dark. Like, it's just the fact that they get whatever meal that they want right before they die. And you kind of think of, like, what their victims went through. I don't know. I don't think I took away from 95 senses what I was supposed to take away from it. I think I was supposed to feel for the main character. And the whole time I was sitting there and, and wondering about the victim and how much pain they went through right before they died. And it's a whole film about capital punishment and the man's last thoughts and the man's last days and everything like that. It was, it really grabbed me. The other thing that I want to talk about before we move on to documentary shorts is they did like honorable mentions for our viewing, probably because it was going to be too short to justify a full ticket price. And so they did these Two honorable mentions. I think it was two. Wild, Wild Summons and then some jazz hipster. It reminded me of the Paula Abdul cartoon cat video, which now I can't think of what the name is. But the Wild Summons was all about salmon and their lifetime, their lifespan of salmon and them going through the river. But instead of salmon, they used animated humans. And it was very jarring at first, and I could see people laughing and then kind of checking out, but I was fully intrigued. And I think if we do more things like this, where we put ourselves in the fins of fish or anything that we are killing at astronomical levels, either with climate change, and if you don't like the word climate change, let's just stick with pollution or over farming or overfishing anything that we are destroying and just being like well they're animals they don't have any souls or whatever your belief is i think it this is a great way for filmmakers to attack the issue and give us a little bit of insight because when they took the salmon out of the water and just started like cutting off their heads but it wasn't salmon it was human beings i that got me. I was like, oh, God, that's fucking barbaric. And so Wild Summons is one. I would put 95 senses probably out of the nominated. And Wild Summons, I wish was nominated. We're never going to do a shorts episode. Probably not. I don't know. Maybe. But um, if we did, I would say Wild Summons <laughs> was snubbed for an Oscar over our uniform, which I thought was the worst. Well, that, all that leaves is best documentary short which we haven't seen any of these yet. I hope I'm not speaking for you as well. 
Nope. I'm waiting for you and your wife to watch the okay, shorts with. Good. And I look forward to seeing it with you. The nominees are The ABCs of Book Burning, The Barber of Little Rock, Island in Between, The Last Repair Shop, and Nai Nai and Waipo. And the only thing I know currently is the most interesting title is also the favorite, and that's The ABCs of Book did I say book burning? I meant book banning. And as a ex-English teacher who once upon a time went to his principal, who I also considered kind of a friend, uh, and told him that I had a book that I would like him to review, because I possibly wanted to read it with my students. And he said, oh, yeah, what's the book? And I said, it's called Harry Potter and the Critical Race Theory. And he did not laugh. And I was bummed because I thought it was pretty funny. But I feel that that one might speak to me. So I'm, I'm excited to watch those with you and Liz. And uh, that's the end of the show. All right. Just as a reminder, listener, the big night is approaching rapidly. It is Sunday, March 10th, beginning at 7 o'clock Eastern. It's not standard time anymore. It doesn't matter. Eastern time, beginning at 7 Eastern. And if you didn't score tickets, you can watch it on ABC. <laughs> All right, everybody, enjoy the Oscars, and Spro and I will be back again the 18th of March, and that's a hard release date, to rehash the 96th Academy Awards to talk winners, losers, outbursts, etc. But until then, I'm Lee. And I'm Spro. <laughs> <laughs> and we hope to see you sitting front row when the envelopes are red. What do I want to bring to the table as host that is different this year? Um... Uh, nothing really. I, it'll be the same. I don't have uh, talents really. I, it's a, not like I have a, a secret love for dance. I am a, uh, you know, I'll go out and tell some jokes. They'll either laugh or they won't. And then afterwards, everybody will say, you are terrible. Jimmy has learned a lot uh, while, from hosting the last three years he's done it. And I think he's taking the lessons he learned, which is to keep it uh, happy, joyful, celebrate the people in the room, keep it moving quickly. Jimmy's also really good on his feet. How do you prepare for a live show and unpredictable stuff? Well, um, you can't predict the unpredictable. I've found that. In fact, it's the very definition of the word. But you can be, you have to have experience. Really, that's the only thing you could do. And to be honest, sometimes I hope things go wrong because it, it mixes things up a little bit. You don't want things to be, you don't want everything to be too wrap, not neatly wrapped up in a bow. You want a little bit of mess. You want a little bit of risk. And it is a live show, and you want to remind people of that. So if something happens, which has things seem to be happening a lot lately, I feel like I'll be ready for it. For all of us, uh, we want audiences to walk, walk away from the show feeling like they have shared an evening with all these incredibly talented people and celebrated this, these films in the way that they should be celebrated. I think we want to take them through a ton of different emotions, whether it's laughter, maybe a tear or two, and a ton of joy. We just want this show to really represent the incredible artists and the incredible filmmakers out there and also celebrate how much we love film and how much we love these movies and what an incredible year it's been. Um, and if we can capture a little bit of that movie magic and put it onto our stage and a little bit of the joy that films give us, then we will have done our job.